today we will go through the solutions of our midterm exam uh, operating systems class uh, and so let's start with some screen sharing i have the assignment uh, sorry not assignment i have the key prepared here so let's go through the solutions then uh, we had four problems to deal with the first one is about synchronization a very important concept in operating systems and you also have an assignment uh, similar to this problem uh, so here we you need to feed your philosophers in such a way that they need two forks and a knife so three equipment to need uh, and they will just be in a box in the middle of the table or something so there is no neighborhood interaction in the, uh, unlike the typical case of the philosopher's problem dining philosopher's problem uh, so first we had four parts but let's uh, get the easy parts out of the way in the beginning the busy waiting must be false no the answer is no here because there is no busy waiting possible in a semaphore solution or in a monitor solution that was the that is the purpose anyway remember busy waiting is uh, we have the process or the thread is in the cpu but it is doing nothing it is just repeatedly executing an empty statement just a semicolon uh, inside the while loop and within the while loop it expects uh, a change in the condition of the while loop so that it escapes that uh, uh, while loop and it proceeds so but that action is called busy waiting because you are just spending time without doing anything uh, that will contribute to the progress of your process or thread that's that's why this is something we should avoid this happens with the peterson algorithm for instance if you recall that uh, but with the semaphore uh, the idea is if you have a condition that is not satisfied so you have to wait then you block blocking means you change your state to a blocking state uh, so in other words to a waiting state and you leave the cpu so you are not just executing empty statements in the cpu this is much more efficient semaphore does that uh, and uh, similarly in the monitor we have uh, so unlike the semaphore we have now a condition variable again it makes you to uh, to sleep to block or to wake up on uh, some conditions uh, so busy waiting is not possible in that scenario either so these are the easy one point parts uh, just uh, that uh, now let's go to the real implementation so how do you implement this two fork one knife action so we start with a set of forks which i have like 50 forks here 50 for 50 knives here it is a variable i declared here i give i have given here uh, so in the a thread of a philosopher, so the eighth philosopher, will think some amount of time, like sleep here, I don't care. Then he wants to eat, for instance. Then in the eating, uh, it needs two forks. So it de decreases the semaphore value uh, one by one. With every weight call, it decreases. And when it becomes negative, it blocks. This is the idea of the uh, weight uh call if you recall uh, so initially if you have 10 forks available then after this nine forks available and after this eight forks are available and they don't stop you because they are available then again nine, 10 knives available after this there will be nine wives uh, knives available in your at your disposal and since you haven't uh blocked you start your eating activity again do something here uh, and then you leave but before leaving let's do some blocking example uh, so assume that currently there are 
th there is only one fork uh, at your box uh, and uh, thread seven wants to eat. So that one fork uh, becomes zero after this. So I escape from here. But now when I am here, uh, I decrease forks to minus one. And now since I have a minus one, I just block here. This is the, so I don't proceed. I can't reach the eat. I am here with minus one. Assume that the processors, the philosophers, they are still eating. So another new uh, thread, like thread eight comes and he wants to eat. So the weight makes minus one, minus two here, because remember it was minus one here. Now for the new thing, it will definitely block, but uh, it will be uh, a minus two. Uh, and in another fact is it won't even he read here because he even couldn't receive the first fork. So the fork semaphore values minus two. And actually, uh, some useful information as we discussed. If you have a negative semaphore value, then there are something get blocked in your system, and the absolute value of that negative value is the number of threads that are blocked. So it is minus two, and in other words, it means that I have two threads being blocked. It was namely seven and eight, if you recall. Okay, so one is the thread eight is waiting in this statement, and thread seven is waiting in this statement. Later on, so assume that thread four has finished eating, so it calls exit eating, where it signals to one fork, uh, and the signal mechanism it increases the value unlike weight which decreases, this increases by one. So it, I had minus two in my hand, it became minus one. And another important thing is, if signal is not, is less than or equal to zero, it means that there are something in the weighting. So I get in first in first out manner, uh, or in any other manner, I get a, a philosopher and a thread and wake him up. So again, fork has become minus one. So there was something here waiting with, uh, I guess I called it thread seven. Okay, so what it does is, uh, it uh, decreases this fork again to minus two because now it is holding it, uh, but it escaped from this weight. And since there are many knives available, I assume that way. So it just escapes from here as well. And now thread seven is eating and so on. But the tricky part is whenever you exit eating, you need to signal uh, to the same semaphore so that you uh, let those who are waiting on this semaphore, uh, they will be notified and they will escape from their uh, waiting state. So this is the main idea. In short, you had to do two weight on forks because of two forks uh, and one weight on knives because of one knife to eat. Uh, and exit is the opposite action. Uh, and there is one little trick here uh, where I want you to let each philosopher eat some many times. And you can just implement that if it is uh, 50. You start a counter with zero in your main block, uh, and you increase this. Uh, and if it becomes 50, then it breaks from the while loop, so it doesn't eat in the 51st time. And the monitor based solution uh, has the similar idea, but now I have uh, I have to implement it with a condition variable. Uh, so there are some global variables here that are being changed uh, during eating entrance. Uh, and these are shared global variables. However, since I am inside the monitor, uh, I, I am guaranteed that there is only one thread inside the monitor at a given time. 
in other words, I don't have to lock before the update to this global and unlock after the update. So you don't have to use any kind of mutex here. This is the goodness, good thing of the monitor usage. Uh, the programming language uh, does it for yourself, uh, in, on behalf of yourself. Uh, so since this is like it puts the implicit mutex lock and mutex unlock calls to the beginning and end of the functions. Uh, so you don't have to uh, write long code here. Also, you may forget to unlock a given lock. That's why uh, you may make some errors and now you are free of those errors. So this is the monitor part uh, and the condition part is also very important. So one thing I expect here is you shouldn't put any kind of mutex here while updating these globals. Uh, this is one point. And the second point is the condition variable. Again, if currently I have uh, uh, I have less than two forks, like I have one fork or zero fork, then I don't even look at the knife situation. I just wait on this condition variable. And later, when someone exits, uh, it definitely signals, okay? So there is no if condition here, very important. So it signals uh, to one of the threads waiting on this same condition variable called can eat. Okay, so this is important, no condition here. Exit means some, the, the resource is definitely released. Okay, so I should definitely signal wake someone up because I already give you some uh, resources so they can proceed. Uh, and these updates are also important because they later decide the situation for the newcoming uh, guys here. Uh, because I now have two more forks, so you have to update the system so that maybe now for a newcomer uh, philosopher, he will see that this statement is false. And this is also false because of these increases here. Uh, and so uh, uh, then it won't wait. It will just escape from the entrance and it will start eating. Okay, so this is the synchronization question. I had some true, false and short answers. Let's go through them. After a fork system call, uh, parent and child processes cannot communicate through uh, structures in their own memory, uh, which is true uh, because they can communicate with shared memory, uh, but they can't communicate with uh, stuff in their own memory because they both have different memory spaces. If you recall, uh, the child copies the content of the parent memory space into its own memory space. So I have two different memory spaces of same size uh, and initially they have also have the same content. But since it's a copy, update in the left memory space doesn't affect the right uh, memory space, hence they cannot communicate. After a fork system call, uh, okay, uh, I have a child process uh, in my system now because of the fork. Uh, and I, I am the parent. So as soon as the child terminates before its parent, uh, then it becomes a zombie process. Uh, why? Because every process, including this child, it terminates with an exit code, okay? Like minus one for an abnormal termination, zero for a successful termination. And that exit code is written into the process control block in the kernel memory, okay? I have this PCB, a little memory parti partition in the kernel memory for a given process. So that exit code is written into that uh, process control block. Uh, and when the parent reads it with the wait system call, it reads it uh, and it's, Basically, the motivation is it knows how the children, how the child terminated. Because if it has terminated with an unsuccessful result, then maybe it can re restart it, etc. So, parent reads it, uh, which is an action called re-aping. Uh, 
and when you read it, then that entry is re uh, deleted forever from the kernel memory as well, because now I have everything I need about that child thing. So it is completely gone. But if the parent forgets to call the wait system call, which is your answer here, then that entry of the dead terminated child still stays alive inside the kernel memory. Uh, that's why I call this child process a zombie process. Uh, so long story short, you have forgotten to call your wait, which caused child to become a zombie. Uh, but don't worry about it. Eventually the init process will reape, will read this value and will clean that child from the kernel memory as well. But currently we have a zombie in our hands. Uh, which of the system calls can be called and never return? Then can be called and never return. I guess we have a grammatic error here. Uh, anyway, uh, it is the exact system call because remember, uh, I am a process. I have my memory space. Uh, so I am uh, so how can we solve this in a nice manner? So I have this uh, memory space. Do you have, I, I have a... Uh, okay, so this is... Uh, so I don't need this colon actually. I have a, a memory space like this. Okay, so this is the... So let, let's actually do it the correct way. Uh, just... Uh, anyway, some. Uh, so let me show this thing. So I have a box actually. So this is not a memory space reserved for a given process. And assume that at this line, uh, I have called exec system call because memory space consists of the instructions, right? It is the main purpose. Obviously, it has other stuff like the variables content, but. I also have the instructions. So I call exec here. And after the exec calls, remember the exec system call, it replaces the whole system, uh, whole memory space with the memory space of the uh, of the new process. Maybe it is the echo process. OK, so then I basically have a different memory space, maybe smaller, maybe bigger, I don't know, but it is completely different. Uh, and now I am here, so I will never, since actually it is kind of false because I replaced this, I don't create any space, so this is misleading. I replace this memory space with the memory space of echo. Okay, so maybe this is the echo process. So I am now here. In other words, I will not be able to come back to this uh, to this next line. So I will not return from here because I don't have that space anymore. I have replaced it. So your answer is exact. Starvation is the case when a thread loops forever until it runs out of memory, false. Uh, because, uh, so here the problem is you are using a resource exhaustively and you finish it. Uh, so it's a problem, but it is not a starvation problem. Uh, starvation is that you are a threat or process that cannot get any service. Okay, so you are probably waiting on a resource which is not available to you for a long time, then you starve to death or you, you just starve. Let's not be dramatic. Uh, so you don't get any service. Okay, starvation is that. If the system is in deadlock, uh, then there is definitely a cycle in the resource allocation graph, true, uh, because if you recall, for a deadlock to happen, you need four conditions to happen, right? Circular weight, which is the cycle, uh, that what for the others? You have this hold and wait condition, which is what? You are a process, you are holding, a resource, at least one resource, and you are waiting on another res on an additional resource. Okay, so you asked for a new resource, 
So maybe it you won't get it, right? Then you will be lacking your existing resources. So hold down weight must uh, hold in your system. Circular weight, this cycle must happen. This third one is no preemption, I guess. So in that case, uh, no resource can be released uh, out of nowhere. Okay, only the process holding that resource can release it voluntarily, and it is when it is done with it, it will be it will release it. Uh, so it preemption means like release it by force. Uh, okay, so it won't happen. Here and also mutual exclusion must happen for a deadlock. What is that? You have uh, the situation where only one process can use a resource uh, at a given time. Okay, uh, so if one of them is false, then you don't have a deadlock. So in this case, the question claims that uh, cycle circular weight cannot be false, which is true. Multi-trading works faster than multi-processing because of uh, keeper context switch. Yes, very true, because uh, uh, with a context switch uh, concerning a process, uh, you have you have to go to a different memory space, okay? Because each process comes with its own big or probably potentially big memory spaces. However, for a thread switch, you have the same memory space because you are multiple threads of the same process. That's why it is very cheap to uh, traverse between the threads within a given process. The more the preemption, the less the number of context switches uh, falls obviously because preemption is uh, the action of getting out of the CP or releasing a resource uh, unwillingly, okay? so they kick you, operating system kicks you out of the CPU. Uh, so if it does it a lot, then it means that a new thing should come to your CPU, which is called context switch. So the more the preemption, the more the number of context switch actually. Name an event after which execution can switch from user space to kernel space. Uh, there are uh, three alternatives that come to my mind. Uh, a system call is uh, where the user process wants operating system to do something for 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 itself uh, for the process, uh, like uh, read from a network socket or something, or like um, fork, like create a new process, etc. So in this case, I am in kernel space, or an exception, maybe. Your process trying is trying to divide something by zero, so uh, you don't know how to handle that undefined mathematical operation. Then the kernel uh, code comes into the CPU and uh, acts accordingly. When you hit Control C in the terminal, what is sent to the process? A signal is sent to the process. You can also give the explicit name of the signal. It is called SIGINT. Uh, actually, it is the answer. But still, if you say signal, it is okay. Multi-threading on a single CPU is effective even if there is no I.O. in your process. So, um, false. So, because uh, I can describe this over... Uh, with some visual, okay, so to, to do that, I open a PowerPoint to be able to draw something. Let's change the uh, application to the PowerPoint then. Where is it? PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, so what was the question, by the way? Uh, the question is about Multi-threading, so let's copy the question here. Yeah, again, some basic mistakes are happening. Uh, anyway, so now here is my drawing environment with my pen. 
So multi threading on a single CPU is effective, uh, even if there is no. So what do I mean by this? So I have a single CPU, okay? So I have two threads. Let this be one thread, okay? And let this be another thread. So I draw them with these weird uh, differences, okay? So I have one CPU, so this is my CPU. So if I have a single CPU, which is this line, uh, maybe I start with this thread, then I context switch, I go to the second thread, it runs for a while, then I come back to this thread, okay? Then I switch, I come back to here, etc., etc. So what is happening is the sum of all these segments is equal uh, if, to the sum if I sequentially execute them, right? I first execute the, this thread and then this thread. So this length is equal to the length here. Obviously, I didn't draw everything here, but it will be equal. So the answer here is multi-threading on a single CPU is not effective. Uh, even if there is no IO. So here I assume there is no IO, okay? So is not, is effective? No, is not effective. False is your answer here then. What if I had multiple CPUs, however? Okay, same question. Uh, I have two CPUs, so CPU one, CPU two. Now, actually I start here with one thread and literally parallelly, in, in parallel, I can run the second thread here, assuming that I handle the race conditions, synchronization issues, etc. Then a context which happens arbitrarily, maybe this thread continues from this CPU, and maybe this is from here. But the thing is, all these amount of work will finish in half time, right? Because half of it will be in CPU one, and the second half will be here. I don't care about the orders. Maybe I execute again here this, and then maybe here this, then it comes here. But the thing is, uh, all this box will be distributed evenly to these two processes. So uh, I think the next question was that multi-threading on a multi-CPU is effective. Yes, then your answer will be true. And so let's also, Talk about this I.O. business. I.O. is, when you have I.O., single CPU is also useful for you, right? Because assume that you have this thread executing and then uh, you have an I.O., okay? Which means that you stop here for an I.O. input output, like a scanf has happened here. So you need some keyboard input. So I am waiting here until the uh, user hits something, etc. So this is kind of an idle time in real world. Then I continue, for instance. So uh, with IO, uh, however, uh, with multi-threading, so if I put this IO into a different thread and Still, I have a single CPU, but when I am here and some IO has happened, but I put this IO uh, into a different thread. Okay, so this is waiting for an input from keyboard, but it is not occupying the uh, CPU currently. I want another thing to run in this CPU, another part of the same thread, does not depend on this data, obviously. So then, as you can see, your thread continues, your main. Uh, rectangle tray uh, can proceed. Uh, okay, so maybe here you are setting up some arrays or something for upcoming purposes, and you don't need this input. This input maybe is related to some other activity later. So you can do that array filling activity here, etc. Uh, so. Um, then multi-threading on a single CPU uh, with, with input output is still effective. So I don't know if I, if I ask that, but now let's come to the exam. Uh, okay. So uh, here I need another uh, 
context switch or um, application switch, whatever. Uh, where is the key? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I don't have to stop sharing. I can just switch between applications during the sharing. Anyway, let's come here. So, as we have established, multi-threading on a single CPU is not effective. Uh, is not effective. So this is false because it says it's effective. Multi-threading on a multi-core with like two cores. I have done it with two cores in the previous example is effective. We have seen that true. And uh, so there is no further question about IO here, but I have also discussed that in the PowerPoint session. Uh, so what is this then? A single threaded process works faster on a multi-core system than it does on a single CPU. And and a single threaded process works faster on a no because uh, you have a single thread okay so even if you have eight cpus at your disposal you can only use one of those cpus at a given time because you have just this single thread for your whole process and cpu is given uh, so you run that process in cpu2 for instance later you run it on uh, you run the remaining on cpu5 etc so you go back and forth between cpus but it is not different than running everything in the same cpu right so this is false the only way a process can change from waiting state to ready state is if an i operation finishes false uh, because it is not the only way, it is a way. So a way, so remember some English. If I have said a way, then this would have been true, but it is not the only way. So what is an alternative way? Uh, semaphores, right? Some blocking. So you uh, you are blocked uh, on some semaphore. You are in the wait call. Uh, so you are in the waiting state and later some signal happens which puts you into a ready state so it doesn't just put you to the running state uh, it puts you into the ready queue and then uh, operating system scheduler process scheduler will put you to the cpu eventually okay so this is false then uh, if mutual exclusion is not enforced in accessing a critical section then a deadlock is guaranteed to occur. No, as I discussed previously at some point here, I think in this part E, uh, I need four conditions to hold simultaneously. Mutex is one of them, but I also need uh, hold and wait, circular wait, and no preemption. Compilers run in the kernel mode. No, compilers are just softwares that don't come with the operating system cd okay these are user space uh, programs this c program can take over the computer with a single cpu no uh, because although it is a stupid program doing nothing it doesn't hurt anyone else because it is not using a memory right it is not allocating memory uh, so what it does is when it turns come to execute in the CPU, it just executes this empty statement uh, and then it leaves the CPU. So it doesn't hurt the system at all. False. However, uh, if I have done a fork here, which is called a fork bomb, uh, a, a popular way to write a virus, then this process, as long as it is running, like scheduler wants it to run, uh, it creates new processes and fork is as you recall it is copying the memory space of the parent and now you have two spaces with identical content initially uh, so if you do it uh, multiple times and every process creates other two so it grows exponentially so it will eventually take over your computer it will freeze uh, also, if you don't want to go to 
fork, you can just do your malloc's, which is also allocating memory without freeing. Okay, so it will also take over at some point. Uh, but currently, this original question uh, is uh, doing nothing harmful. It is false. Initialized to zero, uh, what is the range of possibilities for C after these two threads execute? Yes, after two threads execute this code. So I have a global variable and I don't protect it. So the shared variable uh, is accessed uh, arbitrarily with these two threads. Uh, so in the best scenario, in the expected scenario, as the programmer, uh, pr thread A comes in, it increases C to five after five hits, and then A dies because it terminates, then B comes in and it adds another five, so you have 10. You can't go above 10, obviously. But there is also some cancellations uh, we, when A and B interleave, okay? Uh, so. Because if you recall, actually C++ here uh, is not a single statement. It's not a single, it's a single statement in your programming language, but it unrolls to multiple instructions to be executed in, a, in the CPU. So in particular here, uh, you put this C1 into a register, C into your register R1, then you update this, R1 by increasing it by one. So some arithmetic logic unit is working on this register, not on the variable directly. And then finally, you put this value back in your variable, okay? You write it back. So what happens in a bad scenario is, so thread A comes, assume that C is two currently, okay? So C is two currently. Uh, so A comes, R1 is two now, it increases R1 to three, and now a context switch happens, okay? So process B comes and it reads two into R1, not three, be careful, because C is still two. So process B or thread B makes R1 three, because two plus one is three as we know, and then it is still in the CPU, let's assume that way. C becomes three, okay? But later, when A comes back into CPU, it creates another tree here because it has, uh, it knows R1 as two. So then it writes the tree again to your C. So although I expect two to, became, to become four because of two different thread increases, increments, it becomes three. So you, you are basically, uh, undoing what one thread does. So in the very worst case, you can undo all your increases, so it doesn't increase at all. So it stays at five. Then your answer should have been five, 10. So does this have the same weight as the others? Yes, it is still two points. Uh, okay. Uh, next question is from the process domain. I have, so we talked, a lot about this fork process creation action uh, and you would get something like this but more important than this i will also look at your execution trace uh, and it's also a good way to get some partial credit in case you do some weird mistake in between so let's uh, create this together so i will go to the powerpoint drawing area with this code because I can't memorize it. So let's get the screenshot of this. Uh, and now open a PowerPoint. Okay, now let's, uh, where is the sharing? And what is happening? So I, yeah, I need to stop sharing again uh, and start with the PowerPoint. It is here. 
Okay, so now we are with the PowerPoint. Uh, blank presentation is good. Uh, so there is my screen capture. This is here, okay. So let's put this here and understand how it works. Uh, where is okay so and by the way what was we asking we uh, let the process that started this code has a PID of 777 uh, I like some number seven so actually I should have picked a smaller value here but anyway 777 uh, and the rule is if you create a child then it has the next id okay so you should keep that in mind so 777 then 776 has started this because it is also the child of another thing okay so now open the pen so let's understand how it works so i am here uh, i print y again y is very unnecessary but i put a y here uh, my PID is 777. So this is my output screen on the left corner. Uh, comma or end. The PID of parent, again, you should know this command, get parent PID. It is 776. And now I go to the for loop. I just directly print something. D is I, so zero by what happens oh. oh yeah i hit a key and uh, hold on so i should be more careful uh anyway so let's write it very quick 777 and then we have so john yes uh solution is not visible huh uh yeah we just can see the powerpoint i think like main screen Huh. Oh, interesting. So when I now, what do you see in your screen? A uh, selection of PowerPoint teams, like you know, the main screen. Oh, okay. Uh, let me close it then. Maybe I should. Uh, yeah, uh, I should reshare. Uh, and I, I can actually open an existing PowerPoint just in case. Uh, okay. Now let's share this application. It is an AVL tree, which is quite irrelevant, but anyway. Uh, okay, so let's not use an AVL tree. Uh, let's put that here uh, and now go to the uh, big mode so hopefully now you are seeing something right can you see my pen currently uh we can see the oh yes we can see the yes. drawing yeah okay good so i i begin with 777 so i am just repeating myself sorry uh, and the parent ID will be 776. Uh, and then inside the pre for loop, I just print zero by, because zero is I, zero by. So actually I am, the parent is doing this. So zero by uh, 777. So, so far there is no tree. So the, actually I am also in the AVL tree PowerPoint, which is an interesting coincidence. Well, now, can uh, you please check the chat? What? Could you please check the chat. I can't check the chat currently. I am in the full screen mode. Uh, so here in the execution trace, uh, I have a fork, okay? I am 777. So at this point, I fork. So it means that I will continue and I will have a children. I, I will have a child who will continue. So let's go with the uh, 
parent here. It will print what to the screen? It will print, uh, so let me write it here. I am PID 777. And then uh, the parent PID would be 776. And then the interesting part is coming. And what is and? So the parent gets the uh, ID of the child, which is by rule one further, so 778. Okay, so it prints this to the screen, actually. So let's call this uh, gamma, and so put the gamma here, okay? This is printed. And after this print, since I am the parent and is not zero, but I wait. I wait my for my children to terminate. Okay, so everything here, maybe I will have other branches here. They need to terminate, and only then this will proceed. So let me put a wait here, W. So I am just waiting. Now execution goes to the child, which prints the following. It prints the ID, which is 778. Okay, 778. And then the parent ID, uh, which is 777, because it has created this child. And also the N is zero, right? Because for the child, operating system sends zero here. Uh, Okay, let's call this alpha or whatever, and this is printed. Ah, uh, hojam, uh, sorry for interruption, but like, uh, yes. wouldn't the parent of seven 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 be zero? So like the PID of the init process. But init process doesn't necessarily create the parent, right? So maybe you are in the shell process it has created ah, both, right so okay. the init process just creates the very basic processes that's why i didn't want to get you confused so assume that 776 is the process id of the shell terminal ah, okay okay so, thank you um, okay so then this is the child okay now be careful something interesting is happening since n is zero i don't wait i am the child i come back here okay uh and I print something to the screen. What do I print? Now I is one, right? Because this is the next iteration. So one by, and one by, by who? By, by me. I am the child, seven, seven, eight. Seven, seven, eight. Yeah. Uh, and then, then another fork happens. So I am here, so here is my fork point uh, so what happens is i continue here and there will be a child with me so let's go with the parent here myself so i am here seven i am printing the seven seven eight okay i am doing this print and then my parent is seven 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 and now the child i create it has the id of the next integer which is Seven, seven, nine. Okay, so it is the ID of my child. And again, since n is not zero, I wait. So I wait here, put a W here, wait. So everything here must finish and then I will continue with here. So what is here? I am here, now I am with the child. Okay, so the child is doing here. It prints what? What is the ID of the child? Seven, seven, nine. And what is the parent of the child, 778? And uh, uh, one second. There's still. Uh, yeah, I, am... I also have an interrupt, as you see. Uh, so, 778, what were we doing? Uh, and n, n is zero because I am the child, I have zero in my hand. So I don't wait. I come back here, but now be careful. I was one, but I only do this two times. So I don't come back here again because I is two now. So I come here and I terminate because here it is exit. So I terminate, let's call this T. And once this terminates, now this escapes because it was waiting on me. So I am the parent, 
uh, I got out of this weight. I come here, but this is my second. Uh, I was one and I is two now, so I also don't proceed further. So this also terminates. Wonderful. Uh, uh, and by the way, these prints I forgot to put. Let's call this beta. Beta is printed here. And let's call this theta. Theta is also printed. These are prints. Okay, so the, I have these two terminations. So now I come back here, okay? I was waiting for everything here to terminate. Now I have all these terminations. So remember, I was zero when I got stuck here, right? That is something critical. So when I come here, I is one now, which allows me to make another iteration. So in other words, now I am here and I is one now. So I print one by, by who? By myself. Who, who am I? I am seven, seven, seven. One by seven, seven, seven is what you get. And then I am here. I make another fork. So this is my fork action. This continues and the child continues. So this continues with, again, this print. So let's do this print. Seven, seven, seven. And my parent is seven seven six and the process id of sorry the n is my child id what is that the next integer is 780 okay 780 and this is printed to the screen as a uh, as what there is no greek letter i know further actually i know this it was called phi i think so let's print phi uh, and since n is not equal to zero, I wait. So this waits again blocks. Wait for the child, child or anything here to complete. Okay. So let's go here now. He, this is the last thing. This is my now child is printing this with the PID of seven eight zero. And the, what is the parent ID? It is seven seven seven. Okay. And what is n? It is zero, right? Because uh, zero is returned to the child. Since n is zero, I don't wait. Uh, and i was one, so i is two. Now I don't execute, so I break, I, I finish. So this terminates. By the way, let's also print this. Uh, let's call this line. Uh, what should we call this? Uh, kappa, kappa uh, omega, okay, omega. So let's call this omega. This omega is also printed. Uh, and since everything here is terminated, now I am escaped from this waiting. So the parent here escapes, comes here with i equal to two, but I don't allow it because two is not less than two. I break, I quit, and this also terminates. So your your answer should be this okay uh, and also your execution trace should look something like this a combination of these things will get you partial grades uh, and this parent process it is okay if you just put zero here i i don't really care here i i put uh, the correct way is seven seven six but anyway uh, you can put zero here as well then obviously others will change uh, so I, I will be flexible in grading this, but uh, the general idea is this. So I hope that you give some kind of this notion to me. Okay. Uh, yeah, so now, where am I? Uh, let's come back to the... Uh, uh, Power uh, to what to midterm? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So this is the answer here. Uh, implement piping. So this is something you have done in your first assignment. Uh, one idea of piping is to communicate. Uh, the actual idea of piping is to communicate between processes to establish communication between processes here 
I want Echo to be the uh, uh, child process and I want grab to be the parent process, okay? So parent will execute grab and child, which has fork zero, will execute echo. So don't worry about these arguments, you will just copy paste it here. I will look at these parts actually. So the idea is normally, uh, normally grab gets input from standard input, okay? Because you feed something to this function and then it returns uh, the words uh, matching with the parameter. So, uh, but in this example, as I specify here, I want grab to uh, to work on the output of echo. So, in other words, I will replace the uh, standard input for this process. Uh, so this is a dub2. Remember, replace the second parameter by the first one. What is the first one? It is the zero is the readant, readant of my pipe. So you should first do this and then you should replace it and then close the unused and which is right end here and then execute grep. So now grep blocks basic because there is nothing in the pipe to read. Okay, it just wants to read it from the pipe, but there is nothing there. So Luckily, I have another process in my life, which is echo process. It is going to write to the pipe, same pipe, PFD, PFD, pipe file descriptor. Uh, but echo, as you know, it prints to the terminal using std out. So you close that one. If you don't recall this one value, you can also call file no std out. But uh, anyway same so this is the same as this thing close the unused end and now echo will put push the content to this pipe and later grab will read it from that pipe okay so that would be your answer and finally we come to the deadlock question where i uh, i ask you to implement this uh, bank banker Bankers algorithm, not implement, sorry, ex execute, trace, whatever. Uh, so the available and need structures, uh, we did something very similar during the class. Um, so availability is what I, I am already using this stuff. So look at this column, I use two of the A. I already had three A, two is in use, so one is available. Okay, similarly, the sum here is seven plus six is 13. I have 18 in the beginning, so five is still available. Similarly, like here, I have, I don't know, two, three, and eight, 11, and I have 11 instances, so zero is available. Zero of D is available currently in this snapshot. And how do you create your neat data structure? Initially, each process declares its maximum uh, demand. And currently, I have this allocated situation. So the need will be uh, alloc maximum minus allocation. Okay, so I have three maximum demand, already have one, so I need two more. Similarly, I don't know, let's do it for process three. I, for instance, C. I have five demand maximum and I have already five of them. So I don't need anything else for C. So it is process three and I have zero for this entry. Let's also do the last as a whole. So zero, six, four, two, why is it this way? Because I have a maximum demand of six Ds. I already have four, so I have two needs. Uh, I need four. C, I need 6B, and I need 0A. So this is easy. Now the most valued part is nine points here. Yes, this is in a safe state, but more importantly, you need to show your work. Don't just say yes and no to get a point here. Uh, as I say, show your work. Uh, so you have to find a sequence of processes that can finish gracefully in this configuration. So you must start with P2 here. Okay, so this must be your starting point. Why? 
because the current availability, which is 152, you cannot start P1 here because P1 needs two of D, but I have zero of D. Similarly, if you look at here, all other processes want some amount of D here, okay? But in the current availability, I have no D. So I need this process, the second one, which doesn't need D anyway. So, okay. Ah, uh, Hojab? Yes. Hojab, wouldn't available be 1720? Because if you like look at the second column of allocation, it adds up to 11. Ah, wait, sorry. Sorry, it's 13. No, not 11. Okay. It is 13, I'm right? sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, don't worry. If you solve it with 11 and it is consistent here, you will get uh, the point uh, because we are not in an elementary mathematical school. Okay, okay yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was a small mistake on my part. Yeah, oh, yeah okay. Uh, now let me continue. Uh, okay, so I decide to run P2. P2, uh, if I run P2, then what is the current available? It becomes this. Why? Because, uh, uh, okay, P2 is current. So you need to show me this 2951. I will look at here. So how did you get this? If you ask, uh, once you finish P2, okay, all the allocations will be released back to the system because I know that I can finish it because I can satisfy my need. So I will add this vector to the current availability. So one plus one is two, four plus five is nine, three plus two is five, and one plus zero is one. So I have this availability. Now with this, and also this is gone, so maybe I can even delete it. Uh, with this availability, which one can I finish? Again, here you must pick P4 because uh, because of what? Uh, because P4 is this one, right? Okay, P, you can use this availability to handle this request. However, you cannot uh, handle here, right? Because it needs 2D, but I have only 1D. Similarly, similarly process 3 needs 2Ds, but I have only one D. Process five needs two Ds, but I have only one D. So you have to pick P4, okay? This order is important. P4, with the P4, uh, okay, now let's do it one more time. If I finish P4, then all this allocation will be released back to the system. So it will be added to the current availability. Let's edit. Zero plus two is two. Six plus nine is 15. 3 plus 5 is 8, and 1 plus 1 is 2. So I now have this availability with this, and also this is gone from my life. So with this availability, which one can you finish? Uh, you will look at the needs. So 0, 0, 0, 2. Okay, it, I can finish P1. I can also finish P3. Actually, I can finish everything here at, after this point because I have a lot of availability and the requests are like two Ds here, one and two here, and uh, still I can satisfy P5 as well. So the rest is, I won't do it, but the rest order can be P1, P5, P3, or any permutation here actually. So you can even start with P3, then P1, blah, blah. Comment on the safety of, of the system when B has, has 16 instances, not 18. Uh, then what would happen? So maybe I should look at the whole picture. Maybe I am missing information, okay? So when B has 16 instances, then there, it will affect the availability, right? Uh, because the... Um, when I have 16 instances, uh, I have five availability, sorry, 18. When I have 16 instances, I will have three availability here, okay? Uh, because it will affect this part. Now, with one, three, two, zero, K 
can I finish zero four two zero? No, because I have three in my disposal at my disposal, but I need four, so it can't start. And obviously, the others will still not start because I have two need for these two, two, one, two, two, but I have zero D. So answer is no. Command on the safety of the system, not safe. And finally, let's come back to the original question, Andu. If a request from P1 arrives for 0430, okay, so it makes this request. Can I grant it immediately? No, because currently I have this availability, which is computed here. And because of this C part, which wants three, but I only have two, so I can't make any promises. And to be on the safe side, I will not grant this request. And with that, uh, I have finished all the questions uh, in the exam all my with my solutions so i hope that it is clear uh, please look at these solutions uh, i will put it on my website as well with the red solutions here uh, and also the youtube video will be available at some point uh, so please look at them uh, for two purposes don't make any objection if your solution has nothing to do with my solution uh, and the second and maybe more important purpose is to learn stuff even better uh, because these are important operating system stuff uh, and you may also see them and in front of you in the final etc uh, okay so this is what i want to say actually uh, do you have any questions And um, okay, then uh, see you next week. Uh, Hojong didn't have a uh, what was it? Another lesson this Sunday, I think. Ah, uh, yeah, Th thank you for reminding me. I forgot it, uh, uh, but we shouldn't forget <clears throat> it. Uh, we have to do an additional uh, makeup class for the uh, previous miss. Uh, it is requested. So we will meet on Sunday, this Sunday, two, two days after today. Uh, and we will do the process scheduling chapter. The new, new stuff will start on Sunday. Yeah, thanks for reminding. Uh, yeah, okay, then uh, have a good uh, weekend. Do your homework, please. It is 20% of your grade, and it is also a very uh, fundamental part that every computer science graduate should know. Threads, synchronization, nice stuff. So please pay attention to it. I have extended the, the deadline uh, to the midnight of next Friday. Uh, it is one week from today. All right. Uh, bye bye. Oh, John, can I ask something? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it may be too early for this quest, but it's about the final exam, actually. Uh -huh. um, are you planning to do the final exam um, like the midterm closed book, or is it going to be open book? A cl closed book, yeah. 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 And with that in mind, I am asking questions uh, on that level. You have limited time. So cl close book if, if is for your benefit, uh, in my opinion. By the way, I didn't ask, but how are your feelings about the midterm? Uh, did you do good? Uh, anyone expecting 100 <clears throat> after the solutions today? <clears throat> uh, obviously, 100 is a fantasy, but uh, I hope that you can get good marks here. Uh, yeah, and final will be more about memory management, file systems, uh, but there will still be some touches from these parts. Uh, 
that's why you need to keep everything uh, together. I recommend you to study that way. Don't forget this stuff. So uh, pay attention to the solutions here. And that is it. All right. For the third time and hopefully the last time, uh, have a good weekend. Uh, see you on Sunday. See you, Jam. Thank you for the extra time in the assignments.